Okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, final part of this afternoon. And um, we have now uh, Fabio Gironi from the University of Dublin, who is going to speak uh, on a remarkable topic, which is uh, uh, the two sellers, so Wilfried Sellers, Hollywood Sellers, and the history of American realism. Thank you, Fabio. Thanks. Hello. So, um, given that I'm the last speaker of the day and we're probably all a bit tired, I'm not, to, I'm not going to actually read the paper, but I'll go through the slides and I've got a number of uh, documents and quotes and letters, you know, I'm, I, I like to do the history of philosophy in this kind of old-fashioned way with texts and um, so I'll, I'll tell you a coherent story, but there's no, there's no paper, so I'll just go through the slides and, and in fact, if you have questions even in between, it's no problem if you interrupt me. <clears throat> so there's two main uh, goals that I have with this talk, uh, philosophical and historical, which are a good fit with the theme of the workshop. Um, from the philosophical point of view, I just want to give you a brief sketch of um, the relationship, the philosophical relationship between uh, Roy Wood Sellers and Wilfred Sellers, their father and son. Uh, from now on, I call them Roy and Wilfred, like if, you know, they're my friends, but just, it's just much shorter. <clears throat> and this is something that almost no one has really looked into in any amount of detail. And, um, and I'll, I'll try to convince you that it's actually pretty important. Point number two, uh, the specific relationship between uh, Roy and Wilfred is a good case study of a continuity with differences, I call it, in their philosophical outlooks, because it exemplifies something that happens in those decades between two uh, generations, well, both sort of biological and philosophical generations of philosophers in America. In, in, in the, from the point of view of both the methods and the concerns, uh, even though it's mostly the methods that change and many concerns are carried forward. But we'll, we'll, we'll see this. So very, very generally, why is Wilfred um, relevant to us historically and philosophically to us today? Well, point number one is, is a first generation analytic American philosopher, that is to say, is the first sort of academic generation of American philosophers that studies with and is influenced by um, philosophers, mostly Austro-German and British philosophers, you know, properly analytic philosophers. So, you know, today we've seen about Wittgenstein and Carnap and, um, and Feigl they will work with together, but philosophically Wittgenstein and Carnap are more important. It, it belongs to the first generations of, of young philosophers that take very seriously these new philosophical movements. Number two, I mean, the, the first two points I'm not going to go much into detail into them. Um, number two, he has, he inherits some pragmatist themes, mostly from Lewis, Peirce, and Dewey. And at the same time, he's also kind of responsible for the emergence of what today we call analytic pragmatism or neo-pragmatism. The third point that is, you know, it's, it's wider, it's what I, what I call him is paternal inheritance, and uh, I'm basically going to tell you that all these points are present in Roy and Wilfred follows in his father's foot, footsteps. So, first of all, the historical spirit. This is the probably weakest one to argue for because there isn't all that much evidence. Um, but Wilfred has the deep relationship with the history of philosophy that is very, uh, you know, uncharacteristic for his generation both because of some contingencies in his uh, philosophical training and because of his father. Number two is, again, very uncharacteristic, systematic or synoptic ambition. I mean, synoptic from a sort of, uh, from the point of view of the content of the philosophy and systematic from the point of view of the form of philosophy. Both of them he inherits from his father. Is Again, this is not super evident in Wilfrid's published stuff, but he has the same kind of secular humanist approach to philosophy that he inherits from his father, and he says so himself in the autobiographical reflections. He says he's a, a second-generation atheist, that is, you know, 
coming from his father, and from, from the point of view of proper philosophical doctrines, is in pretty much almost 100% agreement with the main uh, tenets of Roy's philosophy, which are critical realism, evolutionary naturalism, and physicalism. But we'll see how. So um, I'll kind of start my narration by telling you that um, in 1929, uh, for uh, Roy gets invited to Paris to teach there, and all the family uh, flies there. Actually, no, maybe they go because of his mother. Anyway, they go to Paris, and um, Wilfred studies at uh, Lycée Louis Le Grand in the scholastic year 29-30. Uh, this is his, uh, you know, uh, score in um, the, the first year that he was there. And you can see he was, he was doing better in, here it says, uh, natural sciences. And this is philosophy, so he got a 9 in natural sciences and a 7 in philosophy. And this is his notebook in philosophy uh, that, you know, is his notes during the cl philosophy classes that he was taking there. Um, this is the very first paragraph of that very notebook. Um, this is a bit off topic, but I think it's interesting. Um, I said this in, in another venue, but anyway. I think it's interesting that he was introduced to formal logic and to epistemology from a French perspective. He has some, some observations about this in the uh, autobiographical reflections. And in particular, he gets introduced to um, this guy here, Louis Couturat, was a French logician, and as far as I know, he's the first guy that translates um, Russell's Principia into French. So, you know, and he says that his very, very first contact with philosophy was the year that he was studying in Paris. And, and you know, to go to the, the question that someone asked about Sellers and Hegel, this is probably not where Sellers, I mean, uh, Seller says that he, he st his very first kind of philosophical readings are in the Marx French Marxist tradition, but in 1930, um, Hegel was still kind of a forgotten figure in France. Hegel came back in France with like Jean Hippolyte in, in the 40s. So this is probably not where Sellers heard of Hegel first. So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that I can't answer that question, but this is probably not where he comes from. But we can know for sure. I mean, in that period, Neo-Kantianism was, was big in France rather than Hegel. Anyway, why am I talking about this thing in Paris? This is an important paragraph from the Autobiographical Reflections, where he says, my first academic contact with philosophy was in the course of the LIC. Even a service go was thin stuff, but it did give me a sense of how philosophical issues were classified and an acquaintance with some of the major philosophers in French perspective. It suddenly hit me that my father was a philosopher, and then I knew nothing about this dimension of his existence. What my mother was able to tell me whetted my curiosity, and by the time he joined us in February, I was eager to explore his, this unexpected gold mine. My father and I had always gotten along well together, but we had found little to talk about besides topics that arose per accident from the events of the day. Indeed, he had been a distant figure who almost daily disappeared either into the university or into his own study in the attic, where he turned when he turned out book after book. The muffled sound of his typewriter is an almost continuous operation, or so it seemed, was later to haunt me when I began my own attempts at publication. Thus there is a sense in which father and son first met that spring in Paris through the good auspices of philosophy. Needless to say, I found this view congenial, and from the start, and quickly sloughed off the, the pseudo-Hegelian jargon of Marx's natural philosophy. See, this is what I meant. I mean, he probably got some Hegel through Marx's philosophy of the time, but it was, it was a very flimsy Hegel at that time. Um, more resistant, as should have been, were the Hegelian overtones of Marxism as a scheme of historical explanation. In any event, a dialogue was initiated with it, which has continued for some 42 years. <clears throat> so this is the very, well, it's not the first place, this is actually a year before his father died but he tells us pretty clearly that this dialogue was important. Um, this is very much a footnote. Uh, you know, you can ask, so how much is there in mature Wilfred Sellers 
that comes from his period in Paris and, and French philosophy. Well, it's very hard to prove. There is one thing that recently Peetal and, and Stephen Turner have kind of demonstrated. So what happened is that um, Sellers' dad and Sellers, actually Sellers' mother translated that book of that guy, Celestine Bouglé, who was a disciple of Durkheim. And so they translated it into English. And Sellers, uh, Wilfried, read the translation and there's apparently there's a copy, you know, with lots of annotations. And in, in that paper, they kind of show in w the way in which um, Sellers' sort of moral philosophy, if you want, and ideas on we intentions uh, as some roots in Durkheim mediated through this guy. So this is uh, a parenthesis, but you know, maybe there's more there in, in the stuff that he learned, that he first assimilated when he was in Paris. This is uh, the first paragraph of a review that Roy uh, uh, writes on a book about Nietzsche. And he tells us that not long ago in Germany, the reviewer was helping to introduce his son to the prose magnificence of Zarathustra. We read in turns page after page out loud. The glow and vitality of the phrases were arresting. He was a man who felt and thought at once, uh, one and the same time. So why did I put this here? This is uh, Wilfried after Paris went to Germany where he spent one year. And believe it or not, one of these is, is Wilfried Sellers. I, the, the picture is too bad. I, can't, I really can't tell which one it is. It must be one of the boys up here, but I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, it just told us that he was introduced to philosophy in Paris through his father. <coughs> and this is the year after in which Roy is telling us that he was reading Nietzsche to him. So, this is like my bit of evidence that his interest in the history of philosophy at the very least was encouraged by, by his father. Um, and in fact, these are to likely, I mean, I'm happy that no one used this quote so far. These are two, you know, evidences of uh, Wilfried saying up front that, he, that he's interested in, in the history of philosophy. I mean, the first one is pretty strong. I cannot conceive that my views on such topic as, and you know, pretty crucial things in his philosophy would have taken the form they have if they had taken form at all. If I had not devoted much time and energy to teaching and research in the history of philosophy, as I did this to these topics and seek the target. So, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. And this one is, uh, is the draft of a review Wilfrid wrote of some book about the history of philosophy <clears throat> in 1950, I don't know. And he says, the true measure of success as an historian of philosophy lies in the ability to think oneself into the divergent and often radically incommensurable conceptual frames which have made their appearance since Thales stumbled into his well and saw the stars. Um, you know, you could make quite a bit of this, you know, mixing his conceptual conceptual frames and giving them sort of an historical spin about the history of philosophy. But anyway, these are two pieces of evidence that he has this important historical spirit, but we, we know about that. So, <laughs> this is Roy and Wilfrid. I found these pictures and I think they're roughly from the same period. You know, Roy looks about 45, 50, and Wilfred is in early 20s. Uh, so this should have been in the 1920s, 1930s. And this one, I know when it is from, because in 1970, uh, 1970 there was a um, symposium in honor of Roy, of Roy's 90th birthday. And Wilfrid presented a paper at the symposium. So this is Roy and Wilfrid. Roy is 90 and Wilfrid is 58. <coughs> now, in, in the published work of, of Wilfrid, the dialogue that he told us before that has been running for decades, there's, there's not a lot of it in, in the stuff he actually published. And there's three imp very important places, the first of which is uh, certainly the opening, the very opening paragraphs of um, naturalism and ontology. <clears throat> you know, I cut my teeth on issues in issues dividing idealist and realist, and indeed the various competing forms of upstart realism. I saw them at the beginning through my father's eyes, and perhaps for that reason never got into pragmatism. Um, time is unreal, sense data are constituents of physical objects, mind is a distinct sub substance, we intuit essences, these are all issues you can get your teeth into. Uh, 
By contrast, pragmatism seemed all method and no result. This is to, to Roy. Wilfred is more happy with pragmatism. Anyway, after striking out on my own, I spent my early years fighting the war against positivism, the last of the great metaphysical systems. Always a realist, flirting with Oxford Aristotelianism, Platonism, intuitionism, but somehow convinced at the back of my mind that something very much like critical realism and evolutionary naturalism was true. And these two are his father's big ideas. <clears throat> so, you know, he's opening one of his most important texts and, and lectures, in fact. That's, that's a handwritten draft of, of this lecture. And you can see that it's pretty damn impossible to understand what he's writing. Uh, I mean, I, I find it very hard to read his handwriting. And actually, there, the original says something a bit different. He says, um, I've learned about them at my father's knee rather than I saw them through my father's eye. But, you know, the, the point is the same. <clears throat> the other two places where Wilfred mentions explicitly his father are, unsurprisingly, two papers that he gave at two symposia dedicated to Roy in 54 and 71. This is the one he presented at the picture that we saw before. And especially the 1954 one is pretty important because, well, number one, because in the very opening paragraph it's too small and I won't read it, but he says, you know, between me and my father there's pretty much an identity in outlook. The, our, our words and vocabulary is different, but, you know, we share the same vision. First. <clears throat> Second, Wilfred wrote this paper either just before or contemporaneously as he was writing the lectures, the, the myth of the given lectures that will become empiricism and the philosophy of mind. And since by reading this paper you, you, you realize that he spent quite a lot of time reading his father's book, um, The Philosophy of Physical Realism, in order to comment on it, it kind of makes sense to suppose that all the work that he, he had just done reading his father come somewhat went into empiricism and the philosophy of mind as well. And I mean, there, there's pretty good evidence that the themes are, are really pretty similar. <coughs> and this other one is, well, deals with another abs, abs, um, aspect of, of Roy's philosophy. And I'll have a little quote from that later. But anyway, these three are the only three occasions in which he explicitly comments on, on his father. <coughs> So the, the, what I was saying before is that the dial, there's very little in published form about the dialogue, but there is a lot through the correspondence that the two people were sending each other either handwritten or typewritten letters. It's hard to tell how much because some, some stuff has gone missing, but I would guess at least once a month they would, they would write for each other from, from the late 40s to when, when Roy died. So. 73, so they spent decades writing to each other about, about philosophy, also personal matters, but mostly about philosophy. And uh, this one that I show you now is probably my favorite bits of those letters. This is Roy writing to Wilfred after having read this manuscript of Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind. <coughs> and, he tells, and he tells him, Dear Wilfred, your argument is magnificent and I think entirely convincing. It should, I believe, represent an important step in the clarification of issues. Technically, I think it stages an advance in philosophy of a rather epoch-making sort. It is so detailed and careful in its advance from point to point, and so well phrased that I was enthralled. And this is the last paragraph. But let me come back to your book, which I propose to read over and over. You have an assured competence in the mode of expression of your generation, which is fascinating to me. And I know how much thought and labor has gone into its attainment. I am proud of you. Love that. So apart from the fact that it's, you know, it's nice that he had, a, he had a father that was able to you know, assess how good a philosopher he was, the, what's important in here is that <coughs> Roy is a bit of a, occasionally is a bit of a grumpy old man, and it, it, I'll, I'll come to this later, but he doesn't really like the new kind of analytic philosophy that is coming to the States. He doesn't really like Carnap, he doesn't really like Wittgenstein, he doesn't really like philosophy of language very much. But he makes an exception for Wilfred, and he, he recognizes how Wilfred is carrying on his own philosophical project in this different language uh, uh, of which he has an assured competence. You know, he, he can't recognize that. So he, he sort of externalizes his failure of 
learning all this new stuff by being, by being proud of Wilfred. <clears throat> this is another letter, um, which is from February 73, which is a, a, a month or two before he died. And in fact, you can tell there's many <clears throat> mistakes in, in, in writing. Um, well, from the second paragraph, it is clear that you belong to an era in which I existed, how shall I put it, largely an ignored, unbranded background figure, as the land agent put it in his recent article in the New Scholasticism. Sid Alfred Ayer, um, Lewis, and Price got the limelight. I just had to go ahead as well as I could. It requires some fortitude. I am too old now to care much, but the man you mentioned I still think knew little of what Kurtz has called the heroic age of American philosophy. Neither the positivist nor the English were cognizant of it. I don't believe I tried to indoctrinate you. You had to work out your own view. I am proud of what you have done. Again, it's telling us that, you know, there's the grumpy Roy Wood Sellers that says, you know, I was very important, but no one really realized it, and I, and I got put in the, in the dustbin of American philosophy. <clears throat> it tells us that, you know, these new people he really didn't like them, and they didn't know the important era of American philosophy to which he belonged, and I'm, I'm going to go into this soon. And keep this in mind, because it will turn out that it was just right. You know, he's saying the positivists, nor the English, like uh, Russell and Moore, were really knew what was going on in the States, and I have a quote later that, that proves him just right. Um, well, never mind that. <clears throat> so, what is this? Um, you know, philosophical background that, that Roy Wood Sellers, sorry, this context that Roy Wood Sellers is working in, which is also uh, Wilfrid's background. <clears throat> Very quickly, I cannot go much in depth into this. What happens in the, say, five decades roughly before, be, between 1890s and the 1940s, is that through James, a uh, new generation, I mean, they don't look young there, but they were young at the time. A new generation of people come together and they call themselves new realists and go against the then orthodoxy in American philosophy, which was idealism. And the main representative of idealism in the time was the guy down there, Josiah Royce. Royce and James were colleagues in Harvard and they were good friends. They often had disagreements between them. But these new guys come along and uh, strongly oppose idealism and repropose a very strong, even naive in certain ways, forms of realism. <clears throat> and th these are figures that are mostly forgotten today. I mean, that, you know, uh, that guy up there is um, William Pepper L. Montague. This is Ralph Barton Perry, and this is Edwin Bissell Holt. Almost no one knows who they are. And at, but at their time, they were super famous philosophers. Perry was president of the APA in, in 1920-21 and Montague in 1923-24. Holt is very important as well, even though his, his influence went in some other directions. Holt was the supervisor of um, Gibson. What's, what's Gibson's name? Not William. Uh, Gibson, the um, ecological psychologist. Uh, Edward? Well, anyway. So he had that, that influence on psychology coming from James. <coughs> And then, about a decade later, other, another group of people comes about. They call themselves the critical realists, and they criticize the realism of the new realists while agreeing with them broadly on the theme of realism. <clears throat> and this is Roy Wood Sellers. So Roy Wood Sellers belongs to the group of the critical realists. The critical realists were much less uh, cohesive as a group than the new realists. They were. First of all, they were much older when they came together, so they were already you know, well-established philosophers. And Roy is always a bit of a, an external figure. He, he doesn't share many of the ideas of the others and works a bit from the outside, also because you know, he was Canadian, he was teaching you know, away from Harvard and away from all the big poles of American philosophy at the time. So this is the context you know, the stuff that Roy has in mind when he talks about, you know, the great era of American philosophy these decades here. <clears throat> of course, uh, there should be other people here, you know, there should be peers, there should be, should be C.I. Lewis, even though both of them were kind of a bit outsiders. But, you know, we're keeping to at this now. Um, 
so yeah, as I said, there's this anti-idealist reaction. These are the two books these two, two groups published, the New Realism and the Critical Realism in 1912 and 1920. This is the group of people. Again, most of these are mostly forgotten today. Of these guys are slightly more famous, um, except for good sellers, there's uh, Santayana and Lovejoy, even though they're you know, arguably famous for other reasons than philosophical ones. <clears throat> And just to prove to you that it was a, a, an era of, of great philosophical production, these are all books published by the people you've seen before between, I think that one is 1911 and this is 1940 in rough chronological order. And, you know, these are big, you know, actually big meaty tomes of, of the same themes that Wilfred mentioned before, like, you know, time does not exist, we intuit essences, all those problems that he mentioned before. So, you know, and all, all of them roughly sharing um, a realist outlook against the idealism of previous decades. So just to prove to you, you know, there was a, a very active philosophical environment that somehow got cancelled or forgotten. <coughs> Commenting on how it got forgotten. This is uh, a book by a historian, a 1946 book by Herbert Schneider. It's uh, occasionally, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but it's important to, to make the point. Um, this is the preface of that book. You know, it, it tells us that the part nine of this work is entitled New Realism and New Naturalism, but I shall not write to live it. Uh, sorry, I shall not live to write it. And again, uh, the careers of this idea are still too young to merit biography and their significance is still veiled in the future. It seems highly probable though, it cannot be regarded as historical truth, that something genuinely new is brewing. <clears throat> and again, uh, there are good reasons, however, for suspecting that we stand at the beginning as well, at the ending of a cultural epoch. The fact above all, uh, above all others uh, should make us aware of a new epoch is the impact of the recent importation of American ideas. Uh, and I should read it. The reader of the story that follows will note that American philosophy has continually been given new life and new directions by wave of immigration. In America, at least, it is useless, useless to seek a native tradition, for even our most genteel traditions are saturated with foreign inspirations. In, yes, Spanish Franciscans, fresh, French Jesuits, English Puritans, Dutch Pietists, Scottish Calvinists, and so on. Um, and below, America was intellectually colonial long after it gained political independence, and has been intellectually provincial long after it ceased to be intellectually colonial we still live intellectually on the fringe European culture. And then he goes to mention what is this new things that are coming in. And essentially he, he singles out these this three places, Cambridge, Paris, and Vienna. Um, I mentioned these three as outstanding sources of contemporary American thought. And a bit below he tells us, I venture to predict that all types of philosophic thought described in this volume are being so radically revised, reviewed, and reconstructed because of these new, new importations that are decidedly new chapters in American philosophy is being written, the outlines of which we can still not see, though the labor of it is evident on all sides. And he was right. What, so what was happening is that, let me see if I have a, a slide on this. Um, no? Okay. <clears throat> what was happening is that in the 1930s, all the Germans and the Austrians that flee Europe move in the States on the one hand. Then there's, this is the Vienna, the, the dimensions here. Then Paris, it's a more underground um, movement, but there's the, the early movements of phenomenology that come into the States by um, uh, Marvin Farber. And Cambridge, mostly, you know, Russell, Moore, and Wittgenstein, and all of that. So what, what, what this guy is saying, and he's right, is that that tradition that, were, that I just mentioned essentially gets forgotten because this new, very vital, and, you know, presenting itself as a revolutionary way of doing philosophy coming from Europe arrives in the States and takes over the philosophical environment. And Roy hated that. And in, this is a book he wrote in 1968, so when he was very old. <laughs> Reflections on American philosophy from within. He, he comments that um, I could not agree with either Russell or Moore on fundamental points. And uh, it seemed to me that so-called analytic philosophy, which got quite a vogue, was ambivalent. In one sense, I liked its emphasis. In another sense, 
It didn't seem to be very creative in either epistemology or ontology. American addiction to it and disregard of its own momentum struck me as a form of neocolonialism. It was not easy to work out an adequate theory of perceiving which would allow the mediating role of sensations and yet make perceiving cognitively direct. This is his, his central point. Clarification of what this involved has been a life work. I've always been skeptical of men like Wittgenstein and Carnap who brushed this problem aside and tried to work out a framework largely based on logic and semantics. Carnap assumed that the old controversy between idealism and realism could be bypassed because it was otiose. There is reason to believe that he knew nothing about the realistic movement in the United States. So, well, this, this, it's pretty clear what his, what his opinions were. So what is this neo-colonial invasion that he was talking about? Well, mostly this, and you know, if, <clears throat> whether you think it's a good or a bad thing, it was a, a striking decade, the 1930s. This is just these five guys Fagel in 1930, all the way to Hempel in 1939, moved to the States, moved to mostly this university that you see here, and the names below are people that either, uh, you know, did their PhD with them or were heavily influenced with them, and I'm pretty sure there's others, but, you know, this is a quick survey that I did. And just, you know, them five single-handedly changed the agenda of, Ameri of American philosophy and created a new generation of students that were, that almost didn't know, I mean, knew very little what was going on in America like 30 years before, but they knew very well the stuff that these guys were doing. <coughs> and, you know, just because I, I think that this is a point worth emphasizing, it's not them, you know, if you, if you consider the, the sheer amount of intellectuals philosophers, scientists, artists that fled Europe in the 1930s and moved to the States, you know, uh, the, the rise to, uh, to power of, of, of the Nazis were the best thing that happened in, in, uh, to the United States in the 20th century. All these people and, and, those, and those below, roughly between the 30s and the early 40s, fled to the States and mostly stayed there. And, you know, I mean... I guess you recognize most of them. That is von Neumann, that is Hermann Weil, uh, <coughs> Adorno, Tarski, um, the Adorno's friend Horkheimer, and Hannah Arendt. All of these were, you know, Germans, most, yeah, mostly Germans or Austrian. And then again, Schoenberg, Thielig, Thomas Mann, Brecht, Hesse, Max Stearns, Howard Bach. This is all people that fled and went to the States. So, you know. Of course, it wasn't a neo-colonial invasion. These were people that were running away because most of these uh, had some kind of Jewish ancestry behind them and they were actually you know, very much in danger. But it, they did, in fact, change the cultural environment of the states. <clears throat> so what happens is that they, they then actually try to proselytize in the states and explain what is going on in Europe and explain the, the background they're coming from. This is just three examples. There's actually more than this. Um, that is Feigl and, and Snagel and Reichenbach writing papers in the Journal of Philosophy that at the time was the, you know, the strongest philosophy journal in the States, in which they describe what was going on in Germany, what is logical positivism, you know, impressions of analytic philosophy in Europe. You know, they write reports and basically explain to the American audience that reads the Journal of Philosophy, that is uh, 31, 36, 36. You know, this is the new philosophy, this is the new cool stuff that is going on. And, and many people start following it. And in fact, this is, um, this is Feigl in, in some kind of autobiographical reflections of when the, the Vienna Circle moved to, to America. And this sort of, um, you know, confirms Roy Wood Seller's suspicions in many ways. So, <laughs> Uh, the movement quickly aroused a great deal of discussion in, when he moved in the States. Discussion, criticism, and dispute. In retrospect, I feel that we were most hospitably received in the United States, even by our most fervid opponents. It took me a while to realize how much we were indebted to, indebted to our hosts for the gener generous and friendly treatment extended to every one of us. Several of our group arrived in the United States in a spirit of conquest. We were deeply imbued with the conviction that we had found a philosophy to handle philosophies. Naturally, we offended, especially the more tradition-bound thinkers in the new country. Most of us in the Vienna Circle were largely ignorant of American philosophy. 
We had, of course, read some of the work of William James and of Dewey, but we had only a very vague idea of Charles Sanders Peirce. We knew that James and Mack had some affinities and they respected each other enormously. But for the rest, our ignorance was vast. We hardly knew anything about the American philosophical movements of new realism and critical realism. So there it is, Feigl is telling us that yes, when they moved they had no idea what was going on and essentially they didn't care. <clears throat> this is Feigl again, which is also relevant for Wilfrid as we will see now. My own experiences at the University of Iowa and later at the University of Minnesota reflect the rapidly growing influence of our scientifically oriented outlook in philosophy. The Iowa philosophy department had only three members when I arrived there. And while a general course on philosophy and science had been offered there, mine was the first course in the philosophy of science. The situation was similar in Minnesota in 1941. On my suggestion, the young and brilliant philosopher Wilfred Sellers, son of Roy Wood Sellers, was called to Iowa in 1938 and he joined the Minnesota Department in 46. Sellers was a most helpful collaborator. In 1949, we published the first anthology in analytic philosophy. This volume, we included a good many of the now classical essays in the logical positivist, as well as some of their critics. In the same year, we began issuing with May Broadback, John Ospers, and Paul Meal as co-editors, the Journal of Philosophical Studies. The, um, this was and still is exclusively devoted to topics in analytic philosophy, and thus it is the American counterpart of the British Journal Analysis. And, and this picture, in fact, is, is Feigl with Sellers. This is May Broadback. And I actually don't know which of these two guys is Hospers and which one is Meal. But this is the editorial board of Philosophical Studies. The most important thing in, in this paragraph is that Feigl and Sellers in 1949 published this book that he mentioned, which was an anthology of, you know, papers of this new philosophical movement, which is called Readings in Philosophical Analysis. And this book is extremely influential in American philosophy that it becomes sort of the textbook for undergraduates for the next two generations. This is the textbook with the core readings that pretty much everyone reads. It becomes like, I don't want to exaggerate, but it becomes like the Bible of undergraduates in analytic philosophy in America. And, this is a letter that Roy writes to Wilfred a few years later, and he tells him, by the way, how did you and Feigl come to include Stace's refutation of realism in your analytic book? It is merely directed against the new or presentational realism, whipping a dead dog. My own thesis would be, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I recognize the acuteness of many of the younger men and their scholastic training. So much of it seems to me microscopic philosophy without an adequate framework. So what's going on here, this is Roy writing to Wilfred saying, Look, you know, this selection you've done for uh, readings in philosophical analysis, the one, essentially the one paper you've inserted of this debate about realism in, in America is by a guy that is defending this new realism, not the critical realism that I propose that is much better. Why did you do that? And then, you know, I, I recognize that all these younger men have their scholastic training, you know, is, is way of saying, you know, this logical linguistic competence is very impressive, but it looks to me like, you know, unnecessarily narrow and, and, and without an adequate, like a synoptic framework. And, and it's, it's interesting to note that in the preface of this book, Wilfred and, and, and Feigl, you know, uh, comment on how they made the selection of who's included. And, <clears throat> You know, they mentioned the Cambridge movement, uh, Moore and Russell, logical positivism, Reichenbach, blah, blah. These, together with related developments in America, stemming from realism and pragmatism, and the Polish logicians, the fact is that if you actually then go and look at what is included in the book, there actually is almost nothing about the realist tradition in America. I mean, if you look at the names, it's Carnot, it's Schlick, it's Reichenbach, it's Nagel, it's Hempel. It's all the new guys. There's almost nothing. I mean, right enough because it's, it's supposed to be the readings in um, analytic philosophy, this new stuff. But in a way, Wilfred is sort of first-handedly responsible for making new generations of, of young philosophers in America forgot, forget about this, this previous stuff because there's nothing in it in this book that becomes so influential. 
And again, this is another, the same year, this is another letter that uh, Roy writes to Wilfried. I remember when Carnap first came over and he defended methodological solipsism before the Easter meeting. I, I'm not sure what he means by that. But, and he was attacked by Lovejoy. I read upon Schlick and noted his attempt to distinguish between form and ineffable content. I read a paper on it at the Western, but never published it. Now it had always seemed to me that this school tried to get objectivity through some linguistic hocus pocus instead of getting a sound basis in the epistemology of perception, which the realist, realists over here were trying to do. For me, language, behavior develops within the setting of pointing and social action connected with the objective intent of perceiving. <coughs> two reasons why this is important again, because again, is, you know, is this in Carnap and all these two guys that is not exactly clear what they, why they're doing what they're doing with this linguistic hocus pocus. But if you take this, this paragraph, it's pretty obvious how this then came to influence, this is pretty similar to positions that later Wilfrid Sellers will adopt, you know, when, when he gets out of his early, mostly formalist phase and he moves into the, his later semantics, he inherits a lot of this outlook of his father, whether he knows it or not. <clears throat> so, Again, I, I, I'm pretty convinced that Wilfred knew about the importance of these old debates about realism, about epistemology, about metaphysics, but he was also convinced that the new stuff coming from Germany, from Austria, the logical linguistic philosophy was objectively better, was a better method to do philosophy, okay? And this is a paragraph from, um, thank you, Realism and the New Way Words, towards the beginning, um, is commenting on, on stuff that was going on before him. The acts of the tragedy were naive realism, new realism, critical realism, idealism, pragmatism, epistemological solipsism of the present moment. So, it, you know, he's showing that he knows this stuff is going on. It has become increasingly clear in the course of the past decade that this particular tragedy was based on a mistake, on an asking of the wrong of a better, or better, a confused question. This suggests immediately, in view of considerations advanced in the first section of this paper, that the curtain is being run down on this particular cluster of contro controversies, and that new dramatis personae move into the center of the stage. This is true, but these considerations also suggest that while the new questions may be clearer, they will nonetheless be in essence the same, and that consequently the new, will play, the new play will be the old cut and adapted to modern dress. So again, you see this tension in Wilfrid. On the one hand, he thinks that the old discussions were important in their content, but wrong in their formulation, essentially because they didn't have all the logical tools of modern philosophy. On the one hand, he thinks that the new tools of modern philosophy are objectively better, and that you know, these new characters better move to center stage rather than these older, you know, quainter arguments. <coughs> But he recognizes that essentially the, the point of contention, at least for him, it doesn't really apply to others, but for him would be the same, just adapted to modern dress. And this sort of encapsulates his relationship to, to Roy. Wilfred's philosophy is like, in many ways, Roy's philosophy cut and adapted to a modern dress. So, um, now this is stuff that I can skip. I'll, I'll just choose a couple of these. Well, this is nice. I mean, it's, it's less content and more, and more flash, if you want. This is a 1922 paper by Roy in which he's explaining, he thinks that his conception has been not adequately understood. What he wants to say is that a thing is an ordered material and in this order which may arise elsewhere under its control with no identity of material. You know, he's saying that between out there and in here, there is no similarity like it was in that paradigm of sort of uh, Lockean human inspiration. But the idea is that there's an identity of structure between external realities and, well, essentially cerebral processes that take place in the head. <clears throat> and, you know, he uses this, this nice thing. And, and some of you might know, Wilfried in 1979 it's not quite the same point. He's talking about mapping, you know, the missiles that go here and there. But essentially, it is pretty much the same point, you know, that this um, 
But of course, the big difference is that Wilfred now has this new vocabulary, and it makes in terms of you know atomic propositions in a missile comb environment vocabulary. This is all stuff that Roy would not have understood. He's talking about vocabulary and logical proposition. Proposi I mean, Roy almost never uses proposition or vocabulary in his in his work. Um, again, very quickly, the very the very expression, the synoptic vision. You can find it in Roy in 1908, in like the third paper he ever wrote. Uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. The hewing of wood and drawing of water being but preliminary to the synoptic vision without which the weary task work avails little. And you know, it's the, the exact same um, expression, synoptic vision, that would be in PSIM of, of Wilfrid many, many decades later. <coughs> um, well, never mind also because this is hard to read. I'll skip this too, but if we want, to, we can go back to this in the in the, um, the questions. So, the, my main point is that differences notwithstanding, the core concerns of Royer are pretty much the same that Wilfred will have later. This is a sort of map of what, I mean, of course, I have told you nothing about Roy's beliefs, but this is, I mean, you can, you can understand enough from this. Roy believes, <coughs> well, yeah, let's begin that, but it's for, Roy is pretty much convinced throughout his career that the main problem of philosophy is the mind-body problem, or sometimes he calls it the, the um, consciousness-brain problem. The adequate handling of the mind-body problem represents the synthetic stage of any philosophy, and it is one and the same time a supreme test of indication of its power. Epistemology, ontology, and science must be marshaled together, and all the essential terms of the problem must be defined and reintegrated. So, this is the way in which he is systematic. He, he, he develops his own critical realist epistemology, his evolutionary naturalism, which is his ontology, in constant conjunction with the contemporary science of his time. Of course, you know, there was very little of neurophysiology, almost nothing of neurophysiology. Uh, he was more interested in biology and evolutionary biology th than Wilfred was, probably. He was more hostile to physics than Wilfred was, but still, he cared very much in, a, in this kind of naturalism that all of this should be taken together to answer the central problem of the mind-body problem, which in a way, reformulated in a different way, it's pretty much exactly the main concern of Wilfred in PSIM of, you know, the vision of man in the world. <clears throat> so my, my basically, basically my idea is that well, what is it that I wrote there? Uh, the, yeah, the same concerns as Wilfred Sellers, but approached through new resources. So, there, I put contemporary science, both old and new, because, you know, Wilfred had more contemporary science than Roy had, obviously, and also because he was more interested in, in physics than Roy was. But then again, the goal of a synoptic vision of persons in the physical universe, so reconciling the, the existence of con the will and consciousness with a physicalistic ontology, and not just the richness of experience, but of, of vocabulary. This is the way in which Wilfred puts something new that, you know, again, he turns the, he puts this new spin and new, new language into Roy's ideas. Roy's critical realism is in different terms because with different enemies, pretty much the same point of the critique of the given. Roy as a proximate enemy is the, the new realist, Wilfred as the uh, science data phenomenalism, but essentially they're fighting against the same enemy. The history of philosophy, Roy writes a lot of history of philosophy. The big difference, I, I wrote a paper on this, is that Wilfred has had a much better understanding and opinion of Kant than Roy did, which put Kant together with the other German idealists as being, you know, bad idealists. Then something totally new, which is the new methods of analytic philosophy, especially from Carnap and from Wittgenstein, the, the semantic ascent of meta-language, Wittgenstein picturing and all the stuff that we've heard of a couple of hours before. Uh, I should have put this here too, because uh, Roy was very interested in, in a non-reductive naturalism and in the problem of emergence, exact same concerns in Wilfred. He writes about emergence, and he, his naturalism is very much a non-reductive one. And again, 
finally, philosophy as a systematic humanist discipline, which is an ambition they both share, that philosophy should be systematic in form and synoptic in, in ambition. You know, it should comprehend everything of, of, human ex of the, the physical world and the human experience. Everything should be compressed into one philosophical package. Um, it's better if I stop here, so thanks.